So, but we will have special music, okay? If we're not, we're in favor of music here at Pine Forest Baptist Church. If you will, open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 8. We're going to be, again, throughout the morning, we're going to look at different scriptures. So I, in the bulletin, you'll see the title there with selective scriptures. And so we're going to look at several this morning. There is a name in the Bible for God, and it's I Am. And if I was to ask you someplace in the scriptures you might would find that name, where would you tell me? Somebody give me an answer. Where do you find in the scriptures the name given I Am? In Exodus. Where in particular, Brother Wayne, you're right, at the burning bush, okay? So let's look at John chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 51, and I ask that you stand out of respect to the reading of God's Word. Beginning with verse 51, Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom do you make yourself out to be? And Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. You have not known him, but I have known him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Yes, most certainly. I say to you, before Abraham was... I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful for the gift of life that you give us, and we understand that it's because you are the great I am. Father, today we break open your word, and we try to understand who the I am of Christmas really is. So, Father, open our minds and hearts to understand and then give us the strength and courage to apply that understanding to our lives that it will make a difference, not only in who we are, but in the lives of who we come into contact with. Lord God, be good to us. Love us only as you can. And it's in your Son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I am implies everlasting life. When we read that in John's Gospel... What John is saying, God has always been and always will be. He is ever present. He has been from the very beginning. There is no beginning with God. So from the very, 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 there was God. And in the very, 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 this way, there will always be God. God is. He says, I am. No beginning, no ending. I want you to know that I am is used over 68 times. 100 times in the Bible in some form or the other. 6,800 times his name is used, the I am. In the Hebrew it means to be. God is to be. He has always been. He is always going to be. So I want you to understand that. And to get a little picture of it, I want you to see some things. I want you to look with me in Psalms 90. And we're going to look at some scriptures today, so you might as well be ready. Psalms 90 and verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The psalmist understood from before the very beginning as we understand it, to the very end as we will understand it, God always was. And will always be. And he created everything including you and I. And that is the I am of Christmas. So here we are on December the 8th. 
And we live in a world that is completely out of control. And it hasn't just gotten that way in the last two days. It has taken a period of time. And, and I want to put in just a, a little commercial break right here, right now, to say thank you to Bob Lawson. Bob does a good job. If you'll notice the flag is at half mast. He dropped it yesterday. And some of the guys outside asked me why. Y'all know why, right? Pearl Harbor, right. And, and it took me a little while to realize that because there's some things going on in our world here lately. What happened yesterday? There were some shootings, right? Pensacola. And so we see that our world is out of control. And so our flag and our hearts ought to be half-masked all the time because our fellow man is out of control. But understand this, we worship the I Am. We worship the God that was and is and will be. And we can put our faith and our trust in Him to see us through the worst of times. And to see us through... And sometimes the best of times can get us off track. We can trust God. And so, if you go back to John chapter 8 for just a moment, I want you to notice something. Jesus makes some claims there. And he says, before Abraham, I was there. And so a lot of people would tell you Jesus has never claimed to be God and, the, and he's never said, I am God. But what he, this statement is, what he's making a statement about here is that he was before Abraham and the Jewish people understood what he was saying. They realized without a doubt he was saying, I, was, I am God, I was there during Abraham's time. I was there during Jacob's time. I'm there during Joseph's time. I'm there during David's time. I'm there doing Samson's time. He was there the whole time and they understood. How do we know they understood? Because they stooped down and they picked up rocks to kill him. Because they understood he was making a claim that he is God. Now see, that's the problem. They did it right when they bent over. They, uh, they did the right thing when they stooped over before Christ. Because that's what we're going to do one, one day, right? The Word tells us that every knee shall what? And every tongue shall do what? So that Jesus is what? And so they had the part right about bending over... And they had a choice to make when they bent over. They knew that he had claimed to be the great I am. They knew that he had claimed that he is God. And so they stooped over and they could either worship God or they could pick up a rock to kill God. And what did they do? They picked up a rock to kill the true and the living God. And we have the same opportunity. One day we will stoop over if we haven't already. One day we will hit a knee before God if we haven't already and we will make a decision either to stay prostrate before God and to worship God as the true and the living God or either we will pick up a stone and rise up to rebel against God and to kill Him and it's our choice. It's our choice. And in the depths and the crevices of the heart of man lies the ability to choose. To choose to worship and to love God, but also in that deep crevice is the ability to choose to hate and to try to kill the God that created us. And He's left that choice to us. And here we are in the month that we've set aside to worship the birth of our Lord and Savior. And we have to make a decision. So I want to tell us some things today about the I Am of the Bible. And one of the first things I want us to see that's somewhat different 
And I want you to know that the I am is never really found in the book of Genesis. He's known as El Shaddai in the book of Genesis. He's known as the Almighty in the book of Genesis. He's known as the one that can bring the mighty flood. He's known as the one that, that can destroy the world and recreate the world. But he's not known really as the great I am. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. And let's see the difference between Genesis and Exodus. In Exodus chapter 3 beginning with verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Well, we understand. He says, you can tell them that I am present, I am near. Where does he say that? You look at verse 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you. I will be with you and I'm going to send you. But I'm going with you as well. And so the I am, part of his his being as I am is he is present with us. And they don't understand it like we understand it today. Because where is God today? How near is God to us today? Where does God live today? God indwells the believer. God lives in us today. How near is that? How present is that? Everywhere we go, guess what? God goes with us. Wherever we go, we take God. If we're a child of God, we take God with us. That's good, isn't it? I mean, God goes with us. Man, I, I, I'm so proud that God goes with me. And, and I want to thank everyone that prayed for my wife, Friday, as she had surgery. And I want to thank everybody that's praying for me as I try to be a nurse. I'm, I'm good. Man, I am good. I get her situated and give her a pain pill. You know, and, and she'll, she'll say something, and I realize that pain pill's wearing off, so you know what I do? Give her another one. But I appreciate the prayers, the support. God was with us there. So when we walked into that clinic to have the surgery, God was there with us. He's near. When I travel down the road, when you travel down the road going to surgeries in Jackson at 5.30 in the morning, God is near to you. He's present with you. He's present with me. And he needs to be present with me, Andrew, because I'm from one side of the road to the other. But he's near. On the other hand, when we go to the bar, As a child of God, we take God in that bar. Isn't that sad? And when we go to these little league ball games and we act like we know we shouldn't, we've got who with us? God. When we throw those fits, like I saw a guy throw with Carrie that night, If he's a child of God, he's got God standing right beside him watching him throw that fit or in his heart listening to that fit being thrown. And there's something wrong with a Christian that will say things and do things knowing that God is right there with him. There's a problem. And the problem is never with God. Problem is with the person that tends to forget 
that God's there. You see, He's near. Why is Exodus so important to the Jewish people? It's because of that wilderness experience. They begin to get the sense of that presence of God as they walked through the day with that cloud in front of them. And when they camped at night, that pillar of fire was there to stand as a guard. They could see the presence of God. They knew the presence of God was there. And He's with us today. The I am of the Bible lives with us. Look at chapter 6 of Exodus. Not only is the I am present, but he's something new. He's a redeemer. He's a redeemer. Well, wasn't he a redeemer in the, the book of Genesis? There was eight people upon the ark. Where was the redemption for the rest of the world? Well, all they had to do was believe, but it wasn't the same. But when you come to the book of Exodus, God begins to reveal Himself as the Redeemer of mankind. And so you come through the Passover, and you see things begin to happen just a little bit different and you see the blood that was shed for the sins of man. Look with me. In chapter 6, beginning with verse 3. It says, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as mighty God El Shaddai. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groanings of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians kept in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. From their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And with great judgments. I will take you as my people. And I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Who brings you out from under the burdens. Of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land. Which I swore to give to Abraham. Isaac and Jacob. I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. Genesis never really knew that Redeemer. They knew some mercy, but they didn't know the Redeemer. And now we can know the Redeemer God. I am means God has come to redeem. And the reason we're able to sit in this congregation this morning is because God came to redeem His people. They went through the Passover to teach us a lesson that God was coming to redeem His people. And we celebrate. We've set a day aside and we call it Christmas. December the 25th. And it's a day that the Christian world will say, we celebrate this day because God chose to send His Son who left His home in glory, who came to this place to redeem us. And it has to be personal. And so this Christmas, Jesus left His home in glory and came to this world to redeem Andy May. He came here in this world to redeem Andrew Black, Gunnar Appleby, Carrie Luke. He came here to redeem his children. He shed his blood as the great I am. 
that you might have life everlasting and life more abundant and free. The great I am of Christmas. But that's not all. I want you to see something else. I want you to see the power that came with him. And to do that, you've got to go to Luke's gospel to begin with. Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. And we're going to move quickly. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teachings, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the, deacon, when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. So they were all amazed and spoke among themselves. What a word this is. For with authority and power, you get that? With authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. You see the power of that great I am. Nothing can stand in his way. He came here to redeem man, and with that kind of authority, nothing could stop him from going to the cross. And they tried. And they tried, and Satan tried. Go to John's Gospel in chapter 14. And see how Satan tried. In verse 30, they're coming to get him. And he says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He said, he's coming to get me, but he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me a commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. He knew. He knew it was time. He knew Satan had got a plan. He knew Satan was coming for him. He knew. He knew. And he stopped it. He said, I'm going because of God. He has power over Satan. In John's Gospel, chapter 18, in verse 7, and we're going to close. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I want you to think about that. They're coming to get Christ. And if you remember the story, they come up on the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And they come to get Christ and they come with swords and pitchforks, if you will, and torches and it's a crowd of them and soldiers and the captain of the guard and they say, we're looking for Jesus. And he says, I am he. Do you remember what happened? They fell to the ground. I am he. And the power of those words causes that mob to fall to the ground. And there's that choice once again. They can stay there. And worship God. Or they can get up and kill Jesus. And what did they do? They got up. And they killed the Jesus. That came to save me and you. They killed him. Now here's the question. You need to put yourself in that mob. And Jesus has just said, I am He. And it causes you to fall to the ground. What's your response? 
What is your response? Are you going to stay down and worship Christ? Are you going to get up with the crowd and try to kill Jesus? It's your choice. God loves you enough to give you a choice. So what is your choice today? Let's pray. Father God, we're so thankful for all that you've done for us. And Lord, we're thankful for you being the great I am. Lord, that you're near us, that you're present with us. That as the I am, you came to redeem us. And you came with power. And Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit will move. And Lord, if there's just one here that's lost... And Lord, they're feeling that burden of the Spirit upon their soul. That you'll draw them into your kingdom. That you'll give them the strength and courage, Lord, to fall down and to worship you. And to come in truth and to give their life to you. Lord, make a difference today. Father God, give them the strength and courage that it takes. And Lord, I pray for our Christians that are in sin. Lord, that you give them the strength to overcome that sin and to realize that you're involved in their lives, that you're in them. And wherever they go, you go with them. And Lord, if they need to repent, give them the strength to repent of their sins, to turn from their sins, and to walk with you in a way that pleases you. Oh God, be good to us today. We pray these things in your son's precious and holy name.